Hey, hey Jacinta, how's it going? Oh, finally. That was like terrible. You guys trying to get hold of me. I feel awful. No, what do you mean? <laughs> uh, no, no. How are you? Both good? Yeah, very good. Thanks, and you? Very well. Cool. Very, stuff. very well. Cool. How's the, how's oh, um, the baby? Oh, look who you behind you. I was just looking at oh, Nelson Mandela. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. My dad painted that actually. You serious? Yeah, I know. Amazing, eh? Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, That's yeah. That's super cool. Yeah, an amazing cool. man. Yeah, so I've been, yeah, South Africa quite a few times. Maybe, I don't know, maybe eight or ten times now. Oh, wow, yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, there's something special about going to the bush and the game drives and stuff oh, like that. It's this just, amazing it's, energy about it. It's amazing. It's like if it was good. Okay, perfect. And yeah. I know how to word that. It'll just be, I just, I just have to be conscious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we probably won't get too heavily into yeah, that. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. No, that's yeah. Fine. <laughs> cool. Let's man. just double down on that question. For yeah. a second. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, they'll like, be like, oh, what do I need? That sounds like lawyer speak. Yeah, yeah, it's like, say this. I'm like, okay, what do I need to say again? And I'm not good at, I'm not good at that. Uh, you can just say, hang on a second. I'm just getting my script here for a second. Yeah, so I left because. Yeah. <laughs> um, Waking up dog. We're good. Sweet. <laughs> All right. Well, hi there, Jacinda McDonald. Thank you so much for joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. Awesome. We're super excited to be chatting to you today. We were actually kindly put in contact by a mutual friend of ours, uh, Lou Agnew. Um, she's also a sort of woman on a mission just like you. And uh, so thanks uh, for that, Lou. Um, and you're both part of this sort of amazing woman in the world making waves and a difference in the world and uh, we're really honored to be chatting to you today thank you so much that's okay. so kind <laughs> so just into um you were you've always been sort of involved in exercise and the exercise scene um your dad was a pro footy player and your mom was involved in the health scene too what was a typical day like for you just growing up so when I was in primary school, my brother and I used to get picked up from school by my mom and driven to the gym. So they owned a gym in the eighties. And so that was just, we did our homework at the gym. I used to do some aerobics classes and then we would have dinner and go home. And that was just our daily routine. So we just thought that that was kind of normal. Um, so we did that pretty much our whole time we were growing up. Mum and dad were involved in fitness. So we just, uh, that was just, what we accepted as normal. So now looking back, I go, okay, that's not really normal, but at the time it seemed normal. Yeah, that sounds cool. Uh, it sounds like a dream day to me. Like I've always <laughs> loved the gym, so much, but I didn't get to go home to it after school. I would have loved that. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so what, what sort of um, footy did your dad play? So he played rugby league. So he uh, played professionally for about 12 or 13 years and he captained um, a grand final in 74 just before he retired. So wow. he played for a year and that was when it was, you know, you had a job as well as training for footy. So dad's, um, dad's an incredible athlete. He's an incredible, he's just an incredible man. And, and so I was blessed to kind of have him as kind of a role model to when, as I was growing up. And still, I, he's still alive, so I still have him with me. Uh, yeah. Wow. That's so cool. Uh, we actually had a guy called uh, Keegan Smith on our podcast and, and his dad was uh, one of the, I think the main coaches, if I'm right, Craig and Brian in, Smith, in, yeah. Brian Smith. Yeah. Um, so oh, wow. who knows that they might even like know each other. Probably. Yeah, uh, maybe. It's a small yeah. community anyway, isn't it? I guess. Yeah, really small. Yeah. 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 And uh, so do, do you like watch footy now? Is it a sport that you like or? I, I always watched it growing up. So whenever, you know, it was a Sunday night, it was always like sit down with dad and watch the footy. I watch, I still watch it a little bit. Yeah, I still do. So I think um, dad watches it all the time still. He gets frustrated by, um, <laughs> he gets frustrated by the, the, you know, the players when they get, you know, caught doing stupid stuff, illegal stuff. And he's just like, do they not understand the opportunity that they have and this amazing sport? And so he always has a rant. Um, but yeah, I still watch it a little bit, not as much as when I was little. Oh, that's just cool. picture him shaking his fists at the screen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I was thinking, were you, was your mum like one of these typical, uh, at the time, you know, like 
in the leotard in the gym doing the aerobic yeah. class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So dad's, um, my dad's a serial entrepreneur. So mum used to always just support him in whatever business he had. So my dad had some ridiculous businesses, big <laughs> farms and like just stupid stuff. And so when he was like, we're going to do gyms, mum was like, okay. So then she, but she taught classes. And Ooh. so yeah, mum, mum's awesome as well. She's incredible, but she's just such, such an amazing support to dad. And she would just, you know, do whatever's needed. So mum's, mum's pretty cool. Wow. That's always amazing to me how that, that support is, is not easy to be able to, especially serial entrepreneur like that. It yeah. must, must be oh, quite. So frustrating for her. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, at school, uh, Jacinta, you, you weren't always really into the, like, the academic side of things. You were, you were quite creative. Uh, was this something that was like, encouraged with you at school with your parents and by teachers and things? No, I think, you know, I just wasn't, I just always struggled with the, the academic side of school. I just never really understood how it was, how it was really relative to what I was going to do in the world. I didn't really think I would go to university. I just really wanted to get out and, into the workforce. So, mm. um, and then, the, so I think I just took the creative path because I enjoyed it, but it also seemed easier than doing, you know, three unit maths or science. So I think I took, I tried to just get through school. Um, and I, you know, I did fine, but it was just, I think I do love, art. I, I love being creative. So I think now it's kind of come out more wow. on the, uh, in my older years. <laughs> That's so nice. cool. It's so interesting. Like I remember at school, um, yeah, we, you know, I, I was like the more, the kind of mathsy sort of guy. Um, and then you had like the, the kind of the arty crowd and that as well. And I always like, was like, oh, you arty people are kind of strange, <laughs> but they, they, <laughs> it's like, but it's like, it must, I mean, now I'm, my mind is obviously completely different and I'm like, I really wish I'd taken art and I'd done mm -hmm. this kind of um, right brain side of sort of stuff much more yeah. because it's so important, isn't it? And I just wish, yeah, it, it, I wish it isn't, I wish it was encouraged more when we were at school to actually do it because, um, because yeah, you, you find, you actually realize the older you get, the more you kind of need to do that sort of stuff. Yeah, and I think, you know, for me, it's, it's super important to be able to express ourselves, whether it's through art or through writing or whatever it is. So my eldest daughter went to a performing arts school. So she's, you know, super comfortable on stage and she wanted to do that. So that was sort of something I was super, you know, encouraging of. And then my two youngest are at a creative-based learning school because I think it's just so important to try and balance just not, just not academic. So they always, they have to do public speaking and drama and art. So there's a big focus on how they learn. And so I think for me, that's important. So I think that I've really focused on that with the kids. Yeah, for sure. Can, can you just explain a little bit more? Sorry, before you carry on there, Gareth. Yeah. Um, what is like a creative base based school? Like, what does that really? Yeah, so it was actually founded by two guy, two South African guys, <laughs> and um, and so they just call it creative based learning. So my daughter went to Montessori when she was smaller, which is more, yes. um, you know, which is much more down that path. But this was the school, the only school in Sydney that I could find that kind of really focused on. They do public speaking from kindy, so they, they don't have an option wow. to not oh. be on stage and have the microphone and have Goodness. to talk. And so they just really encourage, you know, they, they, the arts, the art room, I was just like, this art room's amazing, just the way <laughs> that it's, like, they're super serious about just all those performing aspects. Wow. Um, and so that's where, and the kids just see that it's normal. And so I just really love the, the fact that they really encourage that, not just academic. Wow. Yeah, super cool. And I can imagine you uh, like having to get told to to leave the class. Okay, it's cool. You've now dropped a kid off. Like it's time. Yeah, yeah to I was like, can I just go in this room? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's so cool. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Like um, that that they that they're doing that sort of like teaching and way of learning. I think it's so important, um, especially kind of in the future that we're going into with, with technology and everything yeah. like that. We're actually. Because we're going to be able to, we can, you know, all the kind of analytical side of things in terms of future jobs and stuff are going to probably be done by like, you know, computers and AI and robots and whatnot. And we're yeah. going to need the other human side much more. So, um, yeah, I agree. yeah, preparing, preparing them for that is awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. So, so, you know, you, you, like you said, you, you, you like that more creative side of things um, as a youngster, but, yeah. and then you got into, you wanted to get into the workforce as soon as you could. Was this because maybe like your parents discussed business at home and we, did you sort of take an interest yeah, in it early yeah. on? I, when I was, I think when I was, you know, we, we started our first gym straight out of school. I was 18. I just turned 18 the day, pretty much around the day we opened our first gym and my brother was 20. And, um, 
we kind of just fell into it. Like I wasn't, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. My brother had just started university and mum was like, why don't we just open a gym? We're all working. I was working part-time at the gym. So was my brother and so was my mum. And I just remember thinking, yeah, sure. Like it can't be that hard. I was obviously stupid. It's 18. <laughs> and, um, and so, and back, that was back in the day when fitness was, you know, cheap. There wasn't, you know, 12 treadmills at X amount of dollars. So we opened the gym for $25,000. Wow. And, um, and I think from there it was like, yeah, well, this is, this is fun. We get to like, we didn't know anything, but obviously we got to learn so much and implement things and try things. And, and it was just an amazing time, I think, for me to be able to go, okay, I have full control over what I want to do. We were our own bosses from, from that age. And mum was amazing. Mum was just like, you guys are going to know how to do this better than me. So you, you guys run it. Mum just sort of sat, sat behind us as a support. So I think that was an incredible thing for her to entrust us. Hmm. with um with this business and it did really well we had that for about five years but we just we learned we knew that we we f quickly figured out we knew nothing <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and hired someone to go okay we have no idea what we're doing and started to really learn um sales and marketing which is just such a huge part of fitness and so um and we worked with her for for the whole five years and just really start to learn about all the aspects of business that we needed to know hmm. it was a great time Oh, and as a, if I understand correctly, you were, you guys were basically doing everything like the front desk and yeah. cleaning. So, and yeah, everything. everything, everything. So I taught my first class, aerobics class on my 18th birthday. Um, and so I taught for about 15 years. I just used to enjoy putting the, this was before Les Mills and pre choreographed stuff. So you put your own sequences together. So that was kind of, I guess, my creative part. And, um, but we did everything. I was more sales. My brother was more, um, more accounts and stuff like that. So that kind of worked in really well, but yeah, we did absolutely everything oh. as you do. That's yeah, a massive, yeah. that's a massive way to learn, isn't it? Just start <laughs> and get in there. And, yeah. and was your, had you been like, had you been chatting about it, say since you were 17, like, you know, later on, we're going to do this or is it, how did that idea? No, I just, I just remember um, we were all working at the same gym and we had done for years. That was my part-time job as, as you know, through my HSC and same with my brother. And I just remember mum just saying, why don't we just, it was weird that mum did actually, why don't we just open one? There's three of us. Yeah. And I was just like, and that's my normal attitude. Sure. Like, let's just give it going. At the time I was young. And, and um, so I don't think we actually spoke about it much. I just feel like, I just remember it just happening. It just happened. Wow. Yeah. So cool. We were lucky. So cool. Well, I, th I think that young mindset is actually quite good in, in many like respects, so you know, because you, I don't know. They, you just don't sort of have these fears and these worries when yeah. you when you're young, and you just go, "Yeah, cool. Of course, I'm going to do that." You know? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, I think I they keep yeah. us, tr us trying to keep that as we get older because it's like, "Oh no, I've done that before," and then this mm. happened, and what if this happens? Totally. And I think it's being able to just take on the challenge and go, "Okay, we'll just figure it out as we go along." And when you're young, that's so easy to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm I'm trying to like figure it out for myself as well because when I was young, I was like. Honestly, like, I didn't care. I just like kind of do anything, whatever, like whatever the consequences were. I was like, oh, it doesn't really matter. You know, like it'll be fine. <laughs> and for yeah. some reason it's crept into my life. Like the kind of older I've got now, like I'm a bit more yeah. kind of, you know, wary of things and whatnot. And I, and I, but I don't know when that sort of, that, that switch happened or if it was just a slow transition. But um, yeah, like you said, I, I want to get back. <laughs> yeah. I think it's slow, it slowly happens to us. And I think it's more people saying you shouldn't do that or this mm. happened to my friend. And the more we know, the more fear we have, I think, of things happening. Um, but most of the time, none of it actually happens. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. fear is, yeah, of course. Yeah. We're, we're so scared of something happening. Yeah. And it's the likelihood of that happening is 1%. It's true. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, so, like there's some ridiculous statistic out there. Like people worry about, 90% not 90 of the stuff people worry about never actually happens. Exactly. <laughs> it's crazy. Eh? And it's also like, you know, we have the, there's so much information as you, as you said, just into like, it's, the, the, we, we get so much information these days and sometimes that information isn't good. You know, like we agree just it over, we overanalyze and we have all these question marks and then, you know, how much of that is actually serving us at the end of the day? Yeah. Most of it isn't. You know, and, and I really restrict how much 
information I get and how much and what I seek out is, you know, is much more important to me than being bombarded with information. Mm. So I think, you know, my, my, my parents were always like, did you see on the news this, this, and this, and this, and this? And I'm like, no, mm. yeah. <laughs> I didn't because it's negative. And mm. I just, I, I don't, that just changes the way that I view the world and changes the way that I see things. So it's important, I think, to know what's going on, but there's too much information sometimes driving our actions. Mm. And I think that then, um, that challenges our mindset to be able to really be expansive and, and, and think about things in the way that we see the world versus being told how we should see the totally. world. Totally. Yeah. 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 I think that the more information we have, uh, the, the more we need to be disciplined and uh, right. we need to add this kind of layer of discipline to our lives, especially now where the more complex it becomes. Um, so, so that we can just actually make it more simple. It kind of sounds like a strange. Right. Yeah. No, I think, I think the biggest challenge that we have is, is being disciplined enough to stay simple mm. in our life because there's, there's so much opportunity to do mm. anything that we want to do and there's so much information that was just overwhelming. And so I think that the discipline for me, over, especially over the last few years, has really been how do I just strip things back and simplify things because the more complicated things get, the more stressed you are and the more the, you just have no clarity. Yeah. And so for me, it's just about that's not important. I'm not interested in that and not even thinking about it. So I think, mm -hmm. but it is definitely discipline to do that. Yeah, do you have sure. any like tips and tricks or things that you've done to curate your, the information you are receiving? Yeah. So I think, you know, so much talk about social media, but I think just really limiting how much time um, is spent on it. Cause you could just be on there for so long, which takes <laughs> up so much of your day, but it also takes you down rabbit holes mm, yeah. just from a mindset. It takes you down. Oh, I wonder if, you know, and then it's like, Oh my God, I've just wasted 30 minutes. So yeah. I really limit social media. I don't really, I don't really know what's going on with the news. I never watch the news on TV. Cool. Um, and so I think I just really try and limit, you know, what do I want to know about and learn about? And I'll seek that out versus watching something that could, you know, spend 30 minutes and I'm like, I just didn't want to know any of that information. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And we think so it's think, important, but it, it is not, you know, that's really? yeah. 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 So I think they, that's what I really try and limit as much technology um, that I can really. Yeah. 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 That's great advice. Definitely. So talking about complexity and all these sort of things that like going a little back in your story, you know, your brother once uh, showed you an article in a magazine that basically changed, I guess, your life's trajectory. Um, yeah. So maybe you can just take us through that kind of, um, you know, that story about Anytime Fitness and how you kind of launched it in Australia. How it came about, yeah. yeah. So we were, um, it was 2007. So I, so I'm just really bad with time um, <laughs> these days. And, um, and we, were both, we had two gyms in the city in Sydney and we were running them. And there's a magazine that comes out every month from the States, which just talks about international fitness and what's going on. And every May they do a franchise edition. I still remember it. It's weird. And I just remember him coming in and just putting it down on the desk and he had these tabs earmarked on these two pages. And I was like, oh, he's like, you should look at this. And I'll be, I'll look at it tonight. So I went home and I just remember reading it and just thinking, oh my God, this is so cool. And I was just like Googling their websites and, um, and I just went back, went back to work in the morning and I said to Justin, that's it. Like, this is it. We're going. So I just wow. emailed, I emailed them straight away, both of the, the two companies. So one was Anytime and one was Snap. Hmm. and um, was like, we're coming over in a few weeks. We'd love to meet you. We weren't really going. I just said we are going. And um, so we got a reply straight away from Snap, and I was like, this is fantastic. And, and so we booked our flights, and about three days before we were leaving, Anytime emailed us back and was like, yeah, we'd like to meet with you as well. And weirdly, they're in the same city in the States. They're both in Minneapolis. In wow, cool. Singapore. So... And so we were like amazing. So we flew over and spent, we spent a whole day with the founder of Snap and had really had a look at his business model and what they were achieving. And then the next morning, we only spent about two hours with the guys at any time. Hmm. And um, as soon as we left, I was like, oh, we definitely have to do any time. Wow. Um, so we just knew culturally and we just loved the guys in the office and they're just amazing. Then they weren't actually ready to franchise. We got the snap master franchise agreement straight away. He was like, here's where it is. This is the terms. And they, the other guys were like, we're not, we don't even have an agreement to show you. We don't even know if we were, we're not ready to go global. Wow. Um, so it took us 12 months to, to secure the rights. And there was a couple of other parties trying to get the rights at the same time. Um, so we did about four or five trips, I think to the U S in that 12 months, trying to seal the deal. <laughs> and, um, and luckily we did, we were, you know, we worked pretty hard to get the rights, but I think 
we just really liked the founders. They really liked us. So I think we had a good, a good synergy from, from the beginning. So we signed in May, 2008 hmm. to launch into the, into Australia and New Zealand. And, and why, what was the back and forth, the flying back and forth? Like what were the kinds of things that you had to like, yeah, so, the line. so we were really doing our due diligence. Like, you know, I think for Justin and I had both worked for Firmwood in franchising. So we understood the responsibility of being a franchisor and what it meant to like promise to franchisees what, you know, what this business is. So we mm. flew over and the joke at the time in the States was that we'd seen more any times than some of the guys <laughs> that worked at the head office. Cause we just used to drive around and, and just pop into any times and talk to the franchisees to see how they were going and, you know, and how their business was. And so we did a lot of that. That was a lot of our trips. And plus we would call into the office and I was, um, I was aware that we weren't the only guys. So I was always selling, always yeah. pitching to yeah. try and um, encourage them to choose us. Yeah. And the last trip was to just fight, finalize a negotiation of, yeah. uh, of the rights. Wow. And, yeah. and what was it about those guys? Like, I mean, obviously, I guess you kind of rely on your kind of intuition sometimes. What was it exactly that you, that yeah, connected so, with them? So the two founders, so Chuck Runyon and Dave Mortensen, they've written a book actually. So they're all about purpose and play and people and, and, and both of them are really, um, really driven to do the right thing and, and they have an amazing community and amazing culture in their office. So I think it was, that's what really attracted me. And I think the business model was so strong um, and they were growing so quickly in the States. So when we signed, they only had 700 open like mm. in America and now we've got, it's like nearly four and a half thousand globally. So mm. they've had a massive growth. Wow. Um, but I just remember thinking they were opening like one club a day and I was like, um, nice. one club a week at the time. And then it, it, it's now at a point where it's more than one a day. And I was like, that's nuts. Like mm. that's just crazy. And so I think we just had a lot of comfort that they had the same values as us, which mm. is really important. Wow. And do you generally, when you do business these days, do you, do you like value that, intuition and that yeah absolutely sort of human connection yeah absolutely i think for you know i think with business with partnerships or with people that you're working with that's 90 percent of it is, is is aligned values i mean skills yes to a degree but if you're going in different directions and you're not aligned on the same path then mm. it's always going to be trouble it's always going to be hard work so i think absolutely that's like that's critical for me yeah you have to have that trust, don't you? Because I think if you don't have Absolutely. that, then there's, then there's, there's nothing. It's just mayhem. It's yeah. Just, it's just, it's, then it's not fun. Then yeah, business sure. is not fun because you just, it's just, it's too hard and it's hard work unless you just know someone's got your back. Totally. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, talk about having, necessary. yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, just talk about like having your back, um, you know, and people you can trust. You obviously doing this with your brother. Like mm. that's a very interesting dynamic that I don't yeah. think many people would actually be able to, to do. Like, how are you guys able to do this as brother and sister? Yeah, I think we're just polar opposites, yeah. like in every way. So I think that's what, I think that's why it works is that, um, you know, we have totally different skill sets. So when something came up that had to be done, it was always really obvious which one of us would do it. Okay. Whereas I think if we were similar, it would be like, well, I'll do that. I know I might do that. Whereas now it's just so obvious that he would do that and I would do this. So that's why I think we, and we've worked together since we left school. And so for us, it wasn't really, um, people always ask us and we're always like, it's not a big deal. Like I don't understand. I kind of don't, under we don't understand why it's a big deal. Um, but yeah, I think the fact that we're opposites just made it so simple. That's really cool. Yeah. It's, so, just so it's a, that, yeah, it's sorry, sorry. It's, it's just amazing. Like that, uh, that you, you're able to have like, do you still have like, you obviously have a good relationship. I'm, I'm taking it yeah. like, you yeah. know, and you get on, it's just, it's really, it's really cool that that's, you know, and, and it's a good lesson for other people. Like, cause you have lots of people going, no, I never do business with family and stuff. And it's like, no, actually, in some cases, it can work as long as you have the yeah, right absolutely. communication. I think as long as you're really clear about who's doing what and, you you know, we obviously really trusted that if someone was doing something, the other person wouldn't even think about it. They're like, I'm not even, Justin is doing that. Or I would say, Justin's on that. I don't even know. Like, go talk to him. So I think the fact that we had that trust made it really easy for, even when people were working with us, it was like, you know, you don't talk to Justin or about that, talk to Justin. And mm. so I think that was really clear. So it made it, made it pretty... Um, pretty simple but i think during the challenging times it made it easier as well that's really nice in what way how do you mean 
I think um, I think as you you know as you're growing a business and if you're growing quickly, you're constantly having to um, either pick up something that needs to be done or delegate something to somebody else. And I think because we were so clear on what our strengths were, it was pretty easy to go, okay, well I'll do that, and you do that, or like you manage that person because that's in that role. So I think if we were more um, similar, it would have been more challenging. If that makes sense. Totally. Yeah. Totally. I think actually Craig and I can probably relate to that, like in terms of how we run the podcast. It was really interesting how we both kind of fell, fell into certain roles and like yeah. taking on certain tasks. Like we didn't even in a way discuss some of the things. It was just like, Craig's got cool. I've, I'm taking the audio editing. I'm like, cool. I got the video and, and, the, and the writing and, and it's just yeah. like, and it yeah. just, it just happened. We almost didn't discuss yeah. it, did we Craig? And like, that's probably yeah. why we, we've been able to always, um, you know, be, be flexible in terms of how we approach things and, and never have, never really come to log ads at all and um yeah. it's uh it's it's really interesting like yeah how that just kind of and, happened and that's yeah. why we're fascinated with your with the, with the story as well like and i think why well, a lot of people are fascinated by the brother sister the story you know because because it's heard so often and, and we totally feel like you should do it well like you, you really have a baseline of trust and as you mentioned earlier trust is a an integral part of what you what everything yeah. is about really and so exactly. if you have a friendship like you're really halfway there because you've really got some trust between the two of you and yeah. so if you have to work on a few other odds and ends you know that's cool but if you've got that big base so actually doing business with a friend or a family member makes some sense in that regard you know what i mean so i totally think it's it's there's some validity to it you know yeah and i think that you know, as long as you're able to have the conversations that need to be had at, at, at certain times. And I think, you know, if I was to go into business, so I've got a couple of girlfriends that I adore and we've spoken about it and we know that if we were to choose, if we chose to do it, we'd be fine because we would have tough conversations if we needed to have them. Mm. And I think it's when people avoid those that it mm. becomes more complicated. So that's the human piece, which is like, you know, if I need to tell you that this isn't working or I need to change this or we need to have this conversation, you have to be willing to have it. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. We've often spoken about that. Actually, is like we we always feel like when we have not that we've ever had any like tough conversations, but you know when there's like, look, we need to sort this thingy out. Let's let's discuss it properly now. When you're finished going through that, it's such a sense of accomplishment because you've you've actually sat down and been able to be totally vulnerable and open about how you're feeling, and it's a massive learning curve for everybody involved. And actually, right. um, when you get through it, you just feel like okay. We need to do more of that and, and just yeah. be totally open with one another. Then you never reach this point where things are bubbling under the surface, you know? Agree. I think it's critical, but it, you're right. It's a skill that you have to learn to do and it's not comfortable. Like it's never, you're never like, oh yeah, I can't wait to have this conversation. It's always <laughs> like, okay, we need, we need to sit down and do it. But you're right. Once you've had it, you're like, oh, I feel so much better and things are so much clearer and, and everyone's, you know, everyone's moved forward from it, but it's, we need to learn to accept that as something that we have to do and not avoid it, I think. Mm. And I think even with, within our family, with the kids, I'm always like, you know, we have to have this conversation of this is what's going on and this is, and that's not okay. And it's like, mm. you could just ignore it and go, oh, they're just kids. But it's like, no, let's teach them mm. how to have those conversations and be respectful. And yeah. so I think, you know, a lot of the things we learn within partnerships or in the workplace relates to how we raise our kids as well. It's like, don't just ignore that behavior. Let's talk about why that's not okay and yeah. how that makes me feel, you know, and I think the biggest breakthroughs I have with my kids is when I'm able to go, that makes me really sad when you do that. And they're like, Oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> they're just getting angry. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. And they're like, oh, I don't want to make you sad. And uh, it's like, you nice. How it, how I feel when you do that. And then they're like, Oh, okay. So it's, it's not okay to do that to someone else and trying to really educate them on the emotional stuff that, mm. that's so important for them to be able to manage relationships. Mm. Great advice. I love that you bring up that, you know, there isn't this massive distinction in our lives between different areas of our lives. You know, there's, it is all intertwined, you know, and the way you, the way you do one thing with your kids will translate into the way you do something with your business partner or whoever else. Yeah. And um, I think that's a great lesson because people often think that they must be totally separate, but mm. actually your values are your values. You know what I mean? And yeah. Yeah. So it's cool that you do that. Yeah. So you've, um, you've had a lot of doubters along the, along the way <laughs> um, and people that have kind of maybe given you a hard time about, you know, when you were starting out and, and you maybe didn't trust that you had the, what it, what it took how did you deal with that? 
I think um, that was when I think it was lucky that it was my brother and I taking that on at the same time. Because I think when we, we'd been in the industry for quite a while when we decided to launch Anytime and we were speaking to people in the industry that we really respected and they were friends. And they were all just like, it's not going to work. Like this, it's just... It's only, it's only, it's only in America, and no one's going to go twenty four seven, and and you know, and we were just like, wow, we just, we were so convinced that this was like absolutely needed in the industry and the next big thing, and so we really had to trust ourselves, because everywhere we looked, people were like, nah, and so we really didn't talk to anyone in the industry for the first couple of years. One, they didn't want to talk to us, um, but two, we were just like, okay, just head down, just work. Um, and so I think that's just, I mean, that's for me is just relying on your own self-belief. And this is, I truly believe this is what I should be doing, whether we, whether we were successful or whether we failed, you know, we, we didn't know what was going to happen, but what we truly <laughs> believed was this is absolutely the right thing for us to do. And it was so crystal clear to us. And so we just had to be able to be strong enough, I guess, to say to people like, I appreciate that you don't think it's going to work, but we, we, we do. So, and I think that that's, that's a great lesson. That we, you know, constantly, it's constantly people, I think, viewing what I do or what I've done to be weird or whatever it is. But it's just like, I'm not really interested in what they think and I'm not really interested in their point of view because I just know what I want to do. And whether it works or it doesn't work, it doesn't really matter. It's just that that's what I want to do next. So um, I think that, I think that we, I think it's important to learn that from a young age to go, okay, this is what I believe and, I, and everyone doesn't have to agree with it for me to think that it's true. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. It's, it's amazing how many like uh, advisors you all of a sudden get when you have like a new idea and <laughs> these are yeah. people that have never been in business or whatever to you as well. You're just like, really? <laughs> we, yeah, we have I so, was, yeah, I think it was only, it was last year or the year before that we got, um, we got, um, t- t- was the, it was, I don't know, it's the, it's, we got honoured in the wall of something for fitness in the fitness from Fitness <laughs> Australia, and I was just I remember giggling to my brother, just going like, "That's so funny, that you know we got this award, but everyone that was giving us the award were the people that were like, it's never going to work." No mm-hmm. ways. Yeah. So, and I think it's just, um, and whether it did, it, it might not have worked, but at least we still would have it, approached it in the same manner. Yeah. You know the way we launched it. So. Yeah, for just, sure. It did work, so that was that's great. Exactly. Yeah, it's amazing. Like, I mean, how many people, I guess we have come to us going, telling us about, you know, you should do this with your podcast and this and whatever. And we're like, cool. So how's your podcast going? You know, like, <laughs> like it's just crazy. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Yeah, so, so, you know, you, you're the, the, the business scaled a lot faster, I think, than, than maybe yeah. you sort of expected, yeah. which is, which is crazy. And now you have a lot of them. Like, uh, like how was that process for you? But then also how did you, like maintain like a good level of communication throughout the whole business with your brother, yeah. with, with, with everyone. And like, I don't know, just keep this kind of human element to, to everything going on. Yeah. I think we, um, we just tried really hard. I think, you know, we, when we, we're not absolutely not perfect. And I think that, you know, the staff that were with us at the beginning, there's still, there's still some that are still there, but I think it was just when you're growing so quickly, you just have to have people that are around you that are adaptable and can deal with change. I remember when we were interviewing early on, one of my key questions was always, how do you deal with change? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because things are moving so fast, like your role is going to change and you're going to have to adapt and move things. So I think that that was something that was super important in the first five years. It's, it's, it's different now. There's a much bigger team and, you know, um, but in those early days, it was just, we were figuring stuff out. Like, although we had systems from the U S our country is, there's still differences with the way that things work with councils and DAs and fitting out and, you know, all kinds of stuff that, that um, seems simple, but adds complexity. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think for us, it was just about, you know, I always wanted the franchisees to be able to trust me. I always wanted them to know that I'm doing what's best for us as a brand. um, And that includes what's best for you. And and you have tough conversations with franchisees as well, because, you know, it's their business, but at the end of the day, you're trying to rally this whole brand to move forward in a direction which sometimes doesn't suit one person, but suits the majority. So I think there's always a challenge there. And I was always wanting to feel like they knew that I was trying to do the best thing for the brand always. Um, and that's super important to me that they trusted that whilst the decision might not be in their favor as an individual, it was probably, it was the best decision for us to move forward. So that's where we tried to keep our focus when we were growing, which was what's going to move the whole brand forward, not just us or the franchisees, but as a group, how are we going to you know drive this fast in the direction it needs to? 
So I think that that was always our focus. Um, and managing the growth was always just, you just tried really hard every day to do, do what had to be done and do it, do it the best way possible. And I think that's one thing that, you know, my brother and I work, uh, worked really hard. We still work hard, but not like we did in the early days. Mm. Um, and I think that franchisees saw that, like they knew that we were in, they were in there, we were in there doing stuff mm. in those first few years. It was, um, it was pretty crazy. Huh. So is that how you built some of the trust was just basically instead of telling you what to do, sh- you would actually show them how hard yeah. you were and what you and would I, do. Yeah. And I think for us, um, we run gyms since we were so young that it was like, they weren't telling us something that we hadn't done. It was like, we've sold memberships. We understand how to do that. We know how. So it was like, it was, so I think they had a level of trust. Okay. Yeah. These guys have been in the industry for so long. It's like, we're not telling you something that we've never, ever done ever. We've done everything that you're doing in your job. And we've done it. So I think that that built a lot of trust as well. It wasn't like we came from a, a totally different industry. It was like we understood the industry so well. And I think that that's what helped us grow really quickly as well. Yeah. And then and, and has, um, are there like more brands now, 24 hour gyms like in Australia? Now? So many. So many. So many. So many. Yeah. So many. <laughs> yeah. There's, um, so we've got 500 open. Wow. And um, there's 250 jets. There's 180 snap. There's like 200 plus. There's so many. Wow. And all the big clubs are now going 24 seven. So now 24 seven isn't actually a selling point. It's like, it's kind of expected. <laughs> um, but I think the reason we've been able to maintain brand advantage and be number one is that now we have more locations than anybody. So because you can use your membership at any of them, we can say to you, okay, there's 500 in Australia that you can use. So no matter where you are, wherever you move, you're always going to have it any time. And so I think it's shifted from when we first opened, uh, it was more like 24 seven was like such a hype thing. It's like, oh, I can go to do whatever I want. Whereas mm. now it's not really that it's that's, that's normal. And now it's okay. You have more locations. So we are more convenient. Mm. Yeah. And the 24 hour thing wasn't a, it wasn't really a thing that people, they will say, let let me reframe that. Some people of the doubters kind of thought, well, why would anyone want to go to gym? Is that right? Yeah. Why would anyone want to go 24 seven? And I'm like, well, they do. It's not just, it's not just the middle of the night. 5% of people come between midnight and 4 a.m. But it's the Saturday after, yeah. But it's the Saturday morning, the Sunday morning, the Sunday afternoon, the public holidays, Christmas Day, Boxing Day. Like it's all those things where I want to be there at five a.m. because I've got a meeting and the gym mm. doesn't open until six. Like it's that yeah. kind of stuff. Totally. That just gives people huge flexibility. Yeah, for sure. What What are the other challenges of twenty four seven? There must be a fair few, I guess. Like. <laughs> Yeah, well, people always like people are going to steal your equipment. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so we've obviously got cameras everywhere. We've got <laughs> the, the doors are locked unless you're coming through key access. So there's all these things that we had in place um, that are still there. But there's really the challenges are what people think they are. I mean, people know that there's cameras. They know they're being filmed. So people are generally really respectful of their club. It's like their club. They're a member, so non-members are, can't come in. Um, so there's not huge amounts of challenges from a consumer's point of view, even from running it, you know, it's an amazingly simple business model. It's not easy, like, like any business, but it's simple. Mm. Yeah. I love that. I love the idea of having less governance and, and empowering people to look after their own stuff. And I think there's something really cool about that. If there's, if it's over you know, big brother, and there's cleaners everywhere all the time and stuff, then you, you probably, I think human nature is to be almost less respectful in a way. So it's quite cool to hear that, that people embrace that and they look yeah. after it more. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I always have like a pet hate of people not putting weights back where they should do. I know. Uh, is, is this, is it something like that you, you guys sort of have an issue with in the gyms? Like, No, I think that, you know, it's just, I think culturally, if we set our clubs up correctly and the managers do their jobs in the early days, it just becomes a culture of like, people don't leave things everywhere. Like, cause they just, I don't, they just don't. Um, They used to more in big clubs. Like remember we had full service clubs with, you know, all the staff that big big gyms have and was much more of an issue then than it is in in any time for sure. Yeah. It's really interesting. I think you, you must learn so much about like people, um, you know, because you, you see them all the time and stuff. And, and I remember like what I used to train at a big gym here in London and, um, I don't know, these people just felt like it's like almost like they had a privilege or a right to be there and they would just leave their towels everywhere and their weights everywhere. And I'd be like, what's your guys issue? Just sort of put this stuff back. So, yeah. 
um, yeah, it's it's cool to hear that. that yeah, I guess you have maybe a, a more mature crowd in Australia when it comes to, to training. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so kind of just like a, a side side question. Um, you've actually met Richard Branson and spent yeah. some time with him on Necker Island. Uh, I did. What are both those things like? What is he like? What is Necker Island like? It's crazy. That was such an amazing experience. And I was um, lucky enough at the time, I guess, I was through Business Checks, which is like a, an amazing organization founded by um, Emma Isaacs, who's an incredible female entrepreneur. And that was the first trip that they'd run. And I was just, they were like, do you want to come? And I was like, oh my God, that's like insane. I didn't know anybody that was going on the trip. And I was like, this will just be like a once in a lifetime. And so the island's unbelievable. Um, and so, so is he, obviously, Richard is um, incredible. He's, he's really shy. And is he? so, yeah, yeah, wow, he's, no he's a huge introvert. Um, and so, so that was really interesting. But obviously the PR and he can, as soon as he speaks and stands up, you can see him turn on yeah. personality. But he's in, incredibly intelligent and, and really humble and was walking around with bare feet, you know, the whole time. And, so cool. Um, it was such a cool experience. And I think, you know, the speakers that they bring on to Nick, so he's obviously there the whole time, but they bring an amazing group of speakers the whole time. And so you see they're there as well. So everyone spends the whole time together for three or four days. So it's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you kind of with the wow. speakers and being able to really have a proper conversation. Um, and so some of the speakers were, so Matt Mullenweg, who started WordPress, was one of the speakers, and he's an incredible guy. Mm. And the founder of Dermalogica, um, Jane mm -hmm. Werman, was there. And it's just like those, those are the experiences that and you just get to hear from, you know, a totally different perspective on business. But, um, and then meet incredible women. I was lucky enough. Most of, the, most of my closest girlfriends I met on, on that trip in 2015. So I think that I'm just wow. very blessed to have had that experience for sure. Sure. Jeez, that's amazing. That's incredible. And yeah. I think there's something special happens when you sit down and you break bread together with people and you, and you, you know, not, not just being talked at and, and, and that's pretty amazing that you got to spend that, that sort of intimate time with, with people in that scenario. Yeah. And I think that, you know, they get invited to, to come to the Island to, to, they have one presentation, but they know that they're there for three days. So they, you know, part of, part of them giving their time is knowing that they're going to have lunch and sit with yeah. these you know, 20 weird women that are going to ask some weird <laughs> questions. Marianne Williamson was actually on the island and cool. she spoke and I just remember talking to her and it's just, it's just one of those moments where you're like, how, I just remember thinking, I don't know how I got here. This is so <laughs> cool. And, um, and just felt so grateful to have been able to have that experience. And for someone that's a bit of an introvert, I, I, I believe I read something about a bar counter. Oh yes, yeah, so we were da yeah. So he's he's dancing, but he goes from that to being, you know, to so shy. So all the photos that we that we see of him, um, but then when you speak to him, he's so quietly spoken. Ah, there's something yeah, so really cool about someone being humble so cool. like that, isn't it? I don't know. So cool. yeah. yeah, yeah, it was an incredible time. So just into things at this stage, I mean, you you guys were just you know hitting the straps, and it was going incredibly well, and. You also had a family coming and you know, all these things and um but it wasn't always easy during that journey and you actually lost a bit of the balance in your life. Um and that's kind of when yoga sort of came into yeah. this onto the scene. How did yoga and meditation affect you and help you? So I um it was two how old's Ari? I always do my reference everything by my children's age. So Ari's nearly nine. So it was 10 years ago. So I was trying to fall pregnant with her and um, business was going nuts. We were three years in. And I just remember the doctor going, are you stressed? And I was like, no, I'm fine. Like, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm doing a lot in the businesses. And he was just like, I think you could be stressed. <laughs> and um he's like I know you're really fit and healthy you obviously exercise a lot and I was like he's like I just really feel like you need to find a way to just relax a bit more and I was like okay and so I'd heard so much about yoga obviously we all have and I was like okay, I'm just gonna try it and see how I go and I started going every Sunday I just go once a week and I was like this is kind of nice it's kind of cool and then I just started to go I could really enjoy it and then I started to shift more from my general fitness being I'm going to do more yoga than I'm going to do, you know, gym work and started to really just really, I really fell in love with the practice. Um, and that sort of soon led to meditation um, as well, which sometimes it does, you know, we tend to do yoga in the physical form and then start to realize what it changes, what it does to our mindset and how we can actually start to really slow down our thinking and, 
Um, and then meditation was probably two years after I started to really start to play with that. But for yoga is a fundamental for me now. I think, you know, I just, whilst I still, you know, go to the gym and run and stuff like that, um, it's just so important for me to have that quiet time. Um, mm. And I think uh, it's totally changed the way that I view mindset and how important our mindset is. And mm. I think that I was always somewhat aware of it intuitively, but I think that it's really strengthened my praxis in terms of why do I think like that? Okay, that's an interesting observation and being much more self-aware of how I'm feeling and when I'm in alignment and when I'm, when I'm feeling like something's not quite right. And so that started 10, yeah, about 10 years ago uh, and I've had a solid practice since then and I, do, I love it. Like I really love it. I think mm. it's, it's, um, it serves me really well. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really is is a game changer. I think definitely, yeah. and um, it's it's good to see that it's like becoming more and more popular, you know. And I wish uh, I wish more people would actually do it, and especially guys as well, because guys kind of still they kind of still look at it like, oh, that's a thing for the the ladies to do, you know. And I'm like, yeah. cool, well, you should come to a class, and then maybe you'll yeah, see how different... easy it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So hard. <laughs> it's exactly. It's amazing how many guys I've actually invited, and like they've actually left like halfway through because they. Uh, and they just could, couldn't basically handle it's it. Too so, hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, and, exactly. And I think it's, um, I think people are like, oh, it's just flexibility and mobility. Mm. And I'm like, it's amazing for flexibility and mobility. But if you're in a pose that's super uncomfortable, mm. stay in it. Yeah. And then that's when yeah. I find the mind chat is super interesting. Totally. Like, yes. oh, okay. I'm just, you know, I'm bitching and moaning about this. And then I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, shift your focus. So I think that's what's, that's what's most challenging about yoga is being able yeah. to calm your mind, you know, during the process. It is for sure. Yeah. And you know what? Yeah. Also just staying still, like still in inverted commas, like in one place yeah. for like, depending on how yeah. long your practice is, say like an hour, like yeah. that's much more difficult than walking around the gym, going to pick up weights, saying how's it to your buddies. You know what I mean? Like, absolutely. It's, there's uh, no it's, distraction. If no. you're on the mat, there's, there is no noise other than your mental noise. Yeah. Um, and that's why I think it's so, that's why I think the transformation is so great through yoga is you're right. You're on that yoga mat for 60 minutes. You're not going anywhere. Yeah. You're not picking up a phone, you're not looking at, you know, changing yeah. the song, yeah. you know, you're in the moment for the whole time. And that's the power of the practice. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Awesome. And, and I think it builds up a good discipline in you as well, you know, and, and a good strength and stuff. So, so maybe yeah. you can ma tell us a little bit about uh, mind body connection and, and why like it is such an important thing. Yeah. I think that when I was younger, it was always, you know, I grew up obviously with my parents obviously being, you know, fit and in fitness, knowing that you just had to exercise. Like I was just like, it's, it's good for your body. That's just what you have to do. So it's always been like, that's a given. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, the, my kids always know that too. They're like, I need, you need to exercise. And, but I think it wasn't until I started to get a bit older that I was like, actually, it's less about the external output and it's more about what happens for me in my mindset when I exercise and how much better I feel during the day. Not just, it's not just the physical part that I start that I think people, people are like, Oh, you should go for a run or you should go for a walk. It's like, yes, physically you should, but your mind state changes by doing it. And the discipline, the discipline of exercise in itself is, um, is the challenge that we should be all taking on. And I think that people are like, Oh, I can't run. It's like, you can run, you're choosing not to run. <laughs> Everybody can run. And, you know, but it's like, I can't. It's like, well, you don't want to, is mm. actually what you're saying. I don't want to run is different to I can't run or right. I can't do yoga. It's like, well, you can, you don't want to, or you think you, you know what I mean? So I think that the mindset of, you know, you have to exercise and the discipline to exercise is something that I think people shy away from. It's like, I don't have time. It's like, we're well, not prioritizing it enough. Yeah, yeah the discipline healthy. of exercise. Yeah, that's very yeah, well said. Discipline is is so important that you know if we can't stick to that, then that f that flows into the rest of our life. It's like, okay, what other commitments have we made that we're not fulfilling? So exercise to me is you know if you you don't want to go for a run, you still go for a run, and then afterwards you're like, oh, okay, yeah. one, I feel better physically. Two, I've had some mental space. But three, I did something that I know I needed to do, so I overcome a challenge. Hmm. And I think that people. Um, think that they're going to want to go for a run all the time or they're going to, I can't wait to go to the gym. That's not the reality. The reality is I don't actually want to go today, but I'm going to make myself go. So that's a discipline. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah. And I think that, yeah, so we avoid that challenge, but at the end of the day, the challenge is what moves us forward in so many other things as well. Yeah, basically yeah. agree. It's such a, it's actually, there are very few people, even if you are like a real sportsman, a woman, very few people are like actually 
always excited to get out there. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, there's days you that you're like, I don't want to do that. Yeah. And but I think I'm going to do of, it anyway. Yeah. Because so, cause I, you know, and that's where I think people are expecting to want to do it. Yes. And that's not reality. There's some days you're not going to want to do it, but you still have to do it. And I think, and off the back of that is that most people that, most people that don't exercise will think that the people that are exercising are, are like loving every second of it. Exactly. And then they go, Oh, but they just, they just naturally love it. And, and it's just not the truth. It's not, it's not true. We don't all love doing that. You know, yeah. it's hard. It's, it's work. It's discipline. It's, you know, I, it's sweaty and you have to have a shower yeah. and it takes yeah. up an hour of your day. Like all these things, we've all got the same excuses, but I think at the end of the day, we just don't prioritize enough what it does for us. And I think for me, it's like, as I get older, I'm, I'm, how old am I? 45 now. And I think, you know, I want to be able to run around with my kids. So my priority to keep my fitness is that's the focus point. It's not just, I, you know, I'm not 20 anymore focused on how I look, but it's mm -hmm. like, I want to be fit and healthy. I don't want to, you know, I want to be able to be with my kids when, when I'm 60, you know, my youngest is only going to be 20. So um, it's, it's a priority. And, and also like when you used to, telling yourself, okay, I'm not that keen, but I'm going to do this. And you feel that reward when other challenges do come along your path that you're not expecting, you suddenly are like, same hey, mindset I've done this before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is like, I don't really want to do that, but it's important. So I'm just, I'm just going to do that. And I think as I've gotten older, I've gotten better at that. Mm. Um, it's something that I really try and teach my kids, which is you might not want to do it, but it's the right thing. So let's just get it done. And then afterwards always like, Oh, that wasn't that bad. Or I feel really good. So it's like teaching them that you have to push through the challenge. Um, and I think that, I think that, you know, my 19 year old, we talk about it and I'm like, it's not always easy. Mm. You shouldn't expect things to be easy. And if you're trying to do something really well, or you're striving for something that means that you're really pushing yourself, it's going to be hard, mm. but it doesn't mean that's wrong. People I think sometimes uh. are like, it should be easier. And I'm like, well, look at what you're trying to achieve. Why would that be easy? Yeah. So there's always going to be a challenge, but I think that we sometimes try and avoid it. Like there's the sneaky shortcut to getting there. And, and it's like, there isn't, you have to go yeah. through the challenge to, to achieve what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. And it yeah. feels good on the other side. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it does. Definitely. <laughs> and then, and the other thing, like, sorry about the, the fitness side of things is, mm. um, you're actually looking after your future self too, you know? So even though, you know, now right. say, you know, in your instance, you're 45 now, but you're actually, you know, looking after 65 year old Jacinta, because when Absolutely. it comes to, we don't, people don't, I, I literally feel like people don't think about their, their lives and their health strategically. Like you don't, they don't no. have like a 10, 15, 30 year plan. You know, I agree. We need to really be conscious of what we're doing now is actually helping future me. You know, absolutely. Because so I think important. if you were to look forward, so important. Like if you look forward, if I look forward 20 years, I'm 65. If I don't exercise, there's a very clear picture of how I'll be. Mm -hmm. If I maintain what I'm doing, there's another very clear picture. And they are so different. Yeah. Like you are two totally different people. And I'm lucky that I had role models. My mum and dad still go to the gym. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they're 75. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 70, dad's 76 or something. And so, and he's had two strokes, but still goes to PT and like, he's incredible. And mum still goes to the gym. So I'm, I'm lucky that that was my role model, that that's just what you do. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, and our, my kids just, you know, that's just normal to them. So they, I don't, hopefully the youngest ones will just not, not exercise. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that it's just, it's not a negotiable. Like people say to me, oh yeah, I know that's just for you because you're in fitness. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm not at the gym all day, every day. Like it doesn't work <laughs> like that. Um, but it's just, you just ha you have to. Yeah. Not it's an option. How, not an option. Gareth and I often say like people are quite sort of generally speaking are quite understanding of, okay, I need to put money, invest my money because it grows and down the track. If I keep investing in it over time, it, you know, compound interest, all this, but we forget that like there are very few people that see their health in that same way. Yeah. And it's like literally, as Gareth mentioned the other day, it's like, you know, you, you're compounding one way or the other. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to compound badly or you're going to compound well. Agree. And, um, at the end of the day, you just have to make the decision of which one is it going to be, you know? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Absolutely. So Jacinta, you actually, you love, you, you love your yoga and you loved your yoga, but there were, there were a few things that you thought could be a little bit reinvented. 
um, about the practice itself. And, and so you opened Urban Yoga and, and then you uh, will um, with a one in the middle. Yeah. So it sounds really amazing. Can you just maybe tell us a little bit more about um, those projects? Yeah, so I think during the, you know, during my practice of yoga, I was always, you know, I love music. I've always loved music. And I think because I used to teach group exercise and I was used to class formats with music, I was always, and yoga, when I started practicing, there was no music. So the room's super quiet. Um, and I always found that it was, the lights were really bright. And I was like, I don't mm. understand why this is the environment that we're doing yoga in. Like mm. if I'm trying to remove myself from distraction, why is everything so bright and I can hear everything? Mm -hmm. And so that was just my brain started going down that path. And so I was like, imagine if you had like a dimly lit room with like music that you moved to versus just, you know, going through sequences. And that was really how... Um, we started urban yoga. It was just out of my desire to like create something that I thought would be super cool. Um, and it's really just, it's, we, we focus really heavily on the design of the room so that it is dimly lit. We have a projector screen, so it kind of takes you out of your day to day. And then the music is, is, is at the forefront versus being in the background. Um, and it's fun and it's simple. We don't use Sanskrit because I, one of the things that I found when I was, you know, learning yoga and even now is it's like, I don't, see the need to learn another language if I'm trying to just get, you know, get my head around the class. And so we don't use Sanskrit. We just use the, obviously the English language for the postures. Um, so I think we're trying to take a little bit of the stigma away for people that I want to try yoga, but maybe it's a bit weird or there's chanting and this weird stuff happening. Yeah. Um, and not that I don't appreciate the practice and, and, and where it's come from. And a lot of people come through, will and then will continue their journey and go into a deeper practice somewhere else. And that's mm. absolutely awesome. Mm. I just wanted to encourage more people to come into the practice and get onto the mat so that they felt comfortable, wasn't intimidating. Mm. I think the fact that the room's dim means that people know no one's really looking at them. Mm. Cool. Um, which is a lot of the time it's like, well, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to be embarrassed or, you know, totally. so I think we tried to take everything away that stopped people from doing it and make it um, more accessible to people. And are they, these like instructor led classes or how does it we work? Do both. Exactly? Yeah, yeah, we do both. So we sequence our classes and then our instructors learn that so that there's some consistency for people. And I think one of the successes of Bikram was that people mm. knew that it was the best yeah. postures. Okay. Um, when you get to know it, you feel a bit more comfortable. So we do the same postures for, for, for 12 weeks. Um, so our, our, you know, our members get to really know and practice and learn them and our instructors teach the same. And then we do some virtual classes where it's on our screen, but our instructors will walk around and assist and align. So they'll do the physical alignment piece, which I think is really good for learning mm. about where your body is in space because we don't always know in yoga. Mm. You think your hand's in a certain place and then the instructor moves it and you're like, oh, it's meant to be. Ah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so, and so that just helps them really integrate the, the, the best postures so that they can do the live classes better as well. So we do a mixture of both. Most of our classes are live. Yeah, that's really cool. I think, I think one of the most important things is the adjustments and, um, yeah. You know, like you, you do, like you said, you just don't know sometimes, you know, especially if you've yeah. only done yoga, like even if you've done it just for a year, you know, and you haven't actually gone and trained yourself, you've just gone to the classes, yeah. you don't necessarily yeah, know. Yeah, you don't know if you're yeah. doing it right or not. And I think I remember I was like six years into my practice and I was doing an up dog, which obviously I must have done thousands by then. <laughs> and I just remember an instructor adjusting my shoulders and I'm yeah. like, oh my God, I've been wow. doing that wrong for six years. No yeah, yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? And I'm yeah. like, oh, that's so important. And so that's one of the reasons we focus on it is because once you've been moved into position you're much more aware when you do it again how to like really get yourself in alive and it's much safer as well yeah 100 percent. i love that you i love the the music aspect i think like yeah. music is so moving and and it's just like if you, I, I can picture you call it an immersive sort of an experience and yeah i can totally picture that because you're going deep into your mind you're going deep into your body and you just sort of immerse in these beautiful images. Yeah. How do you like, how do you choose the music and like, you know? Yeah. So it took us about, it took nearly a year to design the first class. Cause I was super anal about getting the music right. Um, and now we've kind of got a blueprint that we follow. So we know the speed of where we should be in right. each track and the sequencing and how we do that. Um, and so now it's pretty easy for us to pull it together, but it took so, <laughs> it took so long to get it right. Cause no one had really done it. Yeah. Um, whereas now we've got a really solid blueprint. So we kind of know what we're looking for in, in, in any class at any given time as to what sort of beat or what sound we're trying to go for. Um, and then our members obviously tell us which ones they love and, yeah. and, and sort of look for similar yeah. stuff. So yeah, now, now it's easy. If it wasn't to start with. 
Yeah, it's it's important point of so, it. And, and can you maybe tell us about the online side of it? Yeah, so we were filming the classes for our instructors to, to learn choreography and it sort of was born out of that to go, okay, well, what if our members that can't come all the time had access to um, our classes? And a lot of people were asking, you know, how many studios are you going to open? And I, at the time, and I'm still at the time, I don't want to open hundreds of these things. Um, but I wanted to be able to at least offer it to people and scale it to some degree. So we've got an online version, which is all of our classes, as well as some of our classes condensed. So for a 22 minute session. So if you've just got, you don't have an hour or 45 minutes, we've got some 22 minute versions, which are really nice in the morning. Um, nice. Yeah. So we did those as well. No excuses. No excuses. <laughs> <laughs> and have you had anyone like reach out to you about franchising that at all? Because it sounds like it's, it's quite like I haven't yeah. seen that, I guess, here in the UK yet. Yeah, but. a lot. Um, yeah. Ever since we opened, I've, I've been asked that question. And I just, I'm just, I don't want to do it. Mm. Uh, it's not to say I won't, but at the moment I'm like, no. And I also don't think... There's, the systems and processes wouldn't be in a position for me to feel comfortable that that's what we should be doing. Mm. Um, and so for now, it's really just the one studio. I enjoy it. Our staff love it. it you know, it's something that mm. we love creating. But to take it any further at the moment is not is not my plan. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. Like we spoke earlier on, it's about keeping the li your life simple, I guess. Eh? <laughs> Did you hear me there? Sorry? Yeah, and a okay. fran launching that into a franchise would not be yeah. simple. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so another amazing thing that you're doing is the Humankind Project. And it's such a, an amazing like initiative and project that you're working on. And I think it came off the back of a trip that you did to Malawi and then a mm -hmm. business talk that you heard from uh, Muhammad Yunus. And maybe yeah. you could just tell us a little bit about that, please. Yeah, so it was 2008, we just launched Anytime and we were at a growth faculty event and Muhammad Yunus spoke and I just, I just remember sitting there going, oh, my, I felt like my mind was just blown. So he was talking about social business and how we'd started the Grimman Bank and, and we were so busy with Anytime, um, but it was really profound and I just remember, I think that was just a huge seed for me to go, imagine doing business but for good. And he's obviously completely for good. And so I really didn't do anything. That was 2008. And then in 2014, I was just going through a separation and my youngest was, so I was like six months old, my little, my boy. And once again, I was at a business chicks event and they had been speaking about these immersion trips to, you know, either Africa or India. And I was like, I'm going to go, I'm just going to go. And I remember people going like, your son's six months old. You can't just go away for like two weeks. And I was like, I'm just, I don't care. I'm going. <laughs> and so I went in 2014 to Malawi with, um, with business chicks and you see the work of the hunger project and totally changed my view on, you know, what I would probably do next. And I was lucky enough to spend time at, um, with Kathy Burke, who was the CEO of the hunger project in Australia at the time for a week. And I just, and Kathy pushes pretty hard in terms of, you know, expansive leadership. And she was just, I just remember saying to me, she was just like, what else could you do? And I was just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and so human climb was really born off that trip. So we were there for five days and in 2015, in May, we launched the human climb project. Um, and I think we were just looking at this the other day. So I think so far we've raised 1.7 million wow. since we launched in, in 2015. Mm. Um, and majority of that has gone to support the work of the hunger project. Um, and we've done a number of trips back to Malawi um, taking different entrepreneurs and leaders with us as well to experience, I guess, what I experienced in 2014. Um, yeah, it's been, in a, it's something I'm, I, I truly love and it's something I'm really proud of. I think it's probably one of the proudest things um, that I've done and been involved in that gives me probably most, the most fulfilment. Um, and it'll be something that I will continue to do. That's not even a question. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. And, and Malawi is such a beautiful place, uh, isn't it? Yeah. It's amazing. It's uh, just, we, we're going back. So our last trip was in 2017 where we, there was a group of us and we all committed to supporting one community in particular to into self-reliance and they'll reach self-reliance middle of next year. So then as a group, we're all going back wow. to celebrate with the community. And so 
that's something we're all so excited about and yeah. hugely committed to. It was a really <laughs> was a big ask of all of us for what we've done, and and I think that that's that's going to be an incredible trip. Yeah. Yeah. Can you just tell us? Sorry, go ahead, Karen. So, so you know, I was just going to just talk. I went to Malawi when I was eighteen, and it was actually only the second trip I ever did out of uh, South Africa, and um, it was just like incredible, like the the people, um, the the I don't know the whole scenery, the just everything of the the country was amazing, and like I still have some crazy stories which I won't <laughs> tell now, but like about cars breaking down and boats breaking yeah. down, and just like. It was just like everything breaks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was but it was, but it does, didn't bother people. You know what I mean? And they just, yeah. um, they, they were just really happy. But um, how are those but, smiles there, man? Yeah, the smiles are amazing. I even remember, like, I don't know, I, some guy was like, "I really want to be your pen pal and stuff." I was like, "Cool, cool." And I think we had like a couple of letters back and forth, but I, I can't remember what actually happened there because then I came overseas after that. Yeah. But the one thing that they had. Um, I don't know what it was. It wasn't it wasn't Coke, but it was like their own version of like this coke type oh. drink um and it was like know. the best thing ever i can't remember what it was now. <laughs> i mean i totally od'd on that stuff when i was there i was like this is great <laughs> but um but yeah a great experience in malawi <laughs> yes and, and Jacinda, maybe you could just tell us like a little bit more like what what do you actually do with like how does it work yeah, so we we basically exist, so Humankind exists really to support the work of, founder of charities like The Hunger Project that do amazing work on the ground but don't necessarily have the name for people to go, okay, they're raising, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. So we just really exist to find funds and, and encourage entrepreneurs to get engaged with the charity and we vet the charity really well. So I've been obviously on the ground quite a lot. I know I was on the board of, of, of THP. So I understand the numbers and the sustainability and what they're focused on and how amazing they are at it. And so we really work on um, closely with really looking at the global goals. So we focus on the first six, predominantly hunger, poverty, clean water, health, sanitation, and, and wellbeing. And so that's what we've chosen as a foundation to really, really focus on. I think, I think we all know there's lots of um, things that need attention and that's just what we've chosen to mm -hmm. really hone in on um and so today we've funded mainly projects in africa and then some girls education projects in india as well mm -hmm. yeah. that's amazing yeah. and jacinta you tell a story about a woman uh, with three kids that kind of you connected mm -hmm. with because it, it reminded you so much of yourself mm -hmm. just in a different scenario um, and how 30 dollars changed her life mm -hmm. i think one of the things that happens when we're in country and we, and we go through our, the trip is that we meet all these different people and, we, and through an interpreter, we get to ask them about what's happening in their life. What is their life? What was their life like before they did the work with the Hunger Project and what is it like now? So we see the transformation. Um, and I think the most interesting thing that we see is the transformation in mindset. Like we can obviously, the houses are, you know, like our houses here in Sydney at the end. Um, and if you were to look at it just really from an external point of view, you might be like, well, the houses are still not, you know, they, they might not even have a corrugated iron roof yet, yeah. but the transformation in their thinking around their life and what's possible um, <laughs> and the fact that they believe that poverty will end, whereas when you first meet people, which we do do, that haven't gone through any of the leadership work with the Hunger Project is they just are completely resigned to this is the way it is, this is the way it's always going to be. Um, and they've grown up in that. So obviously you would think that. And I remember meeting uh, a number of women, but Christina was one of them and she had three children. I obviously had three children at the time. We were the same age when I first went, I was 40. And um, she, we were just talking about, you know, what are your hopes for your life and what are your aspirations? And it was exactly as our aspirations. I would love my kids to go to school. I want them to be healthy. I want to build a great house. I want to start a business. And so $60 is generally the average um, microfinance loan that's delivered through the Hunger Project. And you see that completely transform a whole family and a whole community. And then that filters into a whole community being transformed just by 60 bucks. Hmm, right. And so they start a business and they, they have to go through adult literacy and learn about managing money. They've never had money before. And so part of all their training before they get the $60 is to learn how to actually, how to actually, be able to repay the loan and what are they going to do with it? What they get, what is their business? How does it work? And so it's all the things that we do. And I think that's, 
the biggest shift when we take people into these countries is to go, we're exactly the same. Mm. Like our aspirations are their aspirations. What we need to learn, they need to learn. It's, it's, mm. it's the same. And we overcomplicate our life with too much opportunity. Mm. And mm. you're able to see with them that with $60 how they can transform. And it's just, it's, it's an incredible process to go through and be able to, I guess, reflect back on your life to go, okay, I'm just caught up in just total bullshit. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And when you see what they do and how hard it is, with their transformation, you just think, oh, we could just do so much more than we Crikey. do. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I always think it's so important for people to go and visit like third world countries and actually yeah. see what it's like, because then you will realize how privileged you are actually. Absolutely. Um, and I think that we just, we just forget that, it's amazing to have running water. It's amazing to have access to all of these things that we do because it's just normal. And it's not, you know, my kids do it as well. And, and I, and I, they don't know any different. And sometimes as adults, we still don't know any different, but when mm. you see a third world country and you go, okay, they have to walk 10 kilometers to get water every day. Um, they don't have any money. They have to grow their own food. And if there's a flood, there's no food. You just, you, you just <laughs> see the world so differently and i think you see your opportunities so much more clearly as to what we have access to instead of focusing on the things the small negatives in our life we should be focused on being grateful on that you know we have all of this at our feet you know mm. and so i think that's a big shift for people which i think i think it's really important to keep yeah. that perspective yeah. and we lose it we get we we get lost in in consuming all this stuff that we don't even care about or even need yeah um yeah and i think that that's you know that just leads to so many issues with mm, yeah. with mental health as well it's just like totally. there's too much choice there's too much information everything's too easy so then when things get hard it's like oh there's something wrong and it's like no we just yeah. lose perspective yeah <laughs> yeah we do for sure um I read this amazing book talking about hunger and, and food and like, I guess also food waste and these sort of things. It was an amazing book called, it's actually called food waste. I think it's by a guy called Tristram Stewart. And, um, he talks about how much food is actually thrown away every single day in the world. And it's something like the, the, the number is like all with all the food that's thrown away, you could feed, uh, all the male malnourished people, uh, one and a half times. So like, you know, like there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be the, the, you know, hunger or anything like that. Um, yeah. which is, which is just crazy that we kind of just do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think even when, you know, when you come back from a trip, we have, we have a, usually have a call about a week later because sometimes, um, coming back from a trip like that back into the way that we live is mm. the shock in reverse. Mm. And you could, I just remember walking down a grocery aisle, just going this, 25 types of peanut butter like yeah come on <laughs> like what is going on yeah. like, why do we need <laughs> there's so much and then you're just like so confused as to which one should i buy and it's like it's such not a problem but we yeah. just you know what i mean there's so much excess in the way that we live mm. that it's a total distraction to living a, a you know much more fulfilled life because we just overcomplicate everything yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think what's one of the beautiful things about is about traveling to countries like Malawi is it's like, that's just, that's reality for people. Yeah. And, um, and like, like we said, when we were catching up, it's like, they're so happy. Mm. Yeah. They're so happy. And they just, they know their priorities. They're super clear on what, you know, what they want to do. They have a sense of achievement every day. Like I did this and I grew this and yeah. I had enough money to go, you know, send my children to school and they're completely fulfilled. And we do all of those things and we're completely not fulfilled. Totally. Yeah, exactly. So I think there's such lessons that we can learn. And, and also community, you know, there's a sense of, yeah. you see your, your neighbor next door, you, you learn to get on with one another and you hang out together and yeah. you're not being bogged down with minutiae, as you said. And yeah. there's something so cool about the, the community aspect of things. Great. You have to, you're in this together. Let's do this. And, and, we and our, you know, we put fences up, and we, we, we want to have, we want to yeah. have no, we don't want to see our neighbors, and and and, yeah. and and which is fair enough, whatever, you know, but, but it's it doesn't necessarily make you more happy. No, I agree. Yeah. I agree completely. Yeah. 
And, and, and do you think that, I think I, from what I read, that's like, there's an initiative uh, to end world hunger, like by 2030. Yeah. Is, yeah. is this something that is achievable? I think so. Like in 2015, there was 170, uh, was a UN initiative where 170 world leaders all got together and signed to say that, the, you know, the goal is to end hunger and poverty by the year 2030. And it's something that the Hunger Project was already working towards. And so I think that, I think it is possible. There's still definitely going to need to be a shift in the way that um, charities deliver on ground services. Um, but I do think it's possible. Like it's halved in the last 20 years. And so I think with, with the right resources and the right mindset towards it, absolutely. And I think for, for, for Humankind Project and for myself, it's something that like, I want to be part of in my generation saying, okay, we did it. Yeah. Like in our generation, it no longer exists. And like mm. Nelson Mandela speaks about it. Like it's, not, it's a human condition. This is not something that's not a God-given, yeah. you know, right, that we have hunger and poverty in the world. It's something that we can fix and address. Yeah. It's just that we need to focus on it um, and teach the people that need to be, you know, lifted from hunger and poverty that it's up to them to do it. They just need the skills and the opportunity. Mm. It's not about giving them food. It's about teaching them how to you know, farm better, how to do all these things. And that's one of the reasons we fund the work with the Hunger Project because it's not about us, it's about them doing the work. We will help you and teach you, but then we want you to be self-sustained in 10 years and we're leaving and you guys are fine. So that's where the shift has to be. Mm. Um, and that's why I think, I do think it is possible. Yeah. So it's not just about handouts. And then I think no. that's what, what's been wrong for so long, isn't it? Agree. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we do on the ground is go into communities and, and they host vision, commitment and action workshops, but they really start to shift the mindset of the community before there's any work that happens. And one of the things that they get asked is where's the food? Because they've had food drops, you know, yeah. for years and years and years. And one of the leaders that we work with, the country director says to them, if that was the solution, then why, why are you still hungry? <laughs> like, it has, it's not working. It doesn't work. That's not what we do. We're not giving you food, but we will teach you better farming techniques to harvest more food. We will teach you how to get a microfinance loan and be able to buy seeds that are better, you know, that'll work better in the ground. And, and so then it's starting to shift their mindset to being, okay, it's up to us to end our own hunger and poverty. You're not going to solve it. We're with you. We're partners with you. Um, but you guys have to do it with your two hands, which is a big thing that we talk about is it's your two hands that are going to do this. We're here to support you. And that's a big shift for them because mm -hmm. other charities have gone in and not, and thinking they're doing the right thing yes. have done food drops. And I think in famine, absolutely. But hunger yeah. and poverty is not solved by that. Yeah. yeah. Great. And, and how do you, I guess you're connecting with some incredible people on the ground that are from there because, you know, I can imagine, you know, these white people from overseas rock up and think they can fix everyone's problems kind of thing. But at the same time, there's people there that are like, that are doing amazing work as well. That yeah, are like so, incentivizing or, or getting people in there and driving this all. Yeah. So with the hunger project, all of the staff that are on in country are from the country. So there's no, there's no white people coming in and telling them they're Malawians. So the country director of Malawi is Malawian. So Rollins grew up in poverty. And so the whole team is from Malawi. They live there, they live and breathe it. So we come in as partners to witness the work of what they're doing and to learn from them. So we're always saying to them, we're here to learn from you around leadership and mindset. Hmm. We're not here to tell you that we're amazing or we know anything. So I think, and they understand that they really truly see us as partners. Cool. They don't see us as, you know, they're the beneficiary and we're the donor and so we don't have that language. So it's like, we're partnering with you. Um, and so that's a really big shift, I think. But yeah, in every country that the, the Hunger Project works, it's the local staff that have grown up there that do all the work. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And at the core of what you're doing, it just seems like it's kind of connecting the love for your family with a, with a sort of with another family because we're all we're just so lucky where we happen to be born. You know, absolutely. And that's literally the only difference. We're not privileged or we are probably we're not um, entitled necessarily to Absolutely. what we have and uh, i guess um how do you get people to see that connection um with you know with that other family that's just like them just in another country yeah i think that i remember ida buttrose i heard her speak once and i remember her just saying she was talking about unicef because she's a huge advocate for unicef and i just remember her saying you know 
when I was a younger girl, I used to think, you know, if I was a young girl in India or in Africa, I would want to think that there's someone else in the world on the other side of the world that be thinking about the fact that I exist. And that really stuck with me with the way that she explained it. And I think when we go in country, like I remember all the women and men that I meet. And so I, I know that they're there. And so by us telling our stories, when we come back, and this is one of the things we teach guys that come on our trips, by you telling the story of that woman, mm. you're not only honoring them, but the people that you're telling the story to, they'll remember that. And, and there's a sense of connection with these, these people that we'll never ever see or meet, but we know that they exist. And I think that's even just by traveling to a third world country, you get exposed to, well, there is millions, there is hundreds of millions of people on this planet living in this way. Mm. And I think that we just, we don't think about it. So I think it's important for us to be able to talk about it and go, okay, you know, imagine if you were born in Malawi, mm. you know, you would want to think that there's someone on the other side of the world with all this opportunity that knows that you exist and that cares that you're there and not just goes, oh, well, it's nothing to do with me. So, and like you said, we're born where we're born by chance. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's the, and we, should understand that as a as a as a human and as a global community, it doesn't make us any less responsible for the people in Africa or India, um, just because we were born here. It's just, it's, it's, totally. I just see that we fight for equality, we fight for gender equality, we fight for you know, um, a big thing in, in Australia obviously was gay marriage, which I obviously openly support, but the equality in, in hunger and poverty is is so disproportionate hmm. that we should also be fighting for that as well. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You really, yeah, you just, you kind of making me even like think about my own actions and stuff now, like in terms of, you know, just remembering also where I'm from, you know, like from South Africa and like there's, yeah. there's huge issues there and uh, I need to really go back and actually, um, you know, maybe contribute more and, and do more stuff. Uh, so, so thanks for kind of just, you know, igniting that sort of idea. Um, but just, just talking about, I, I think all this, a lot of what you do is obviously around business and creating businesses and these sort of things. And, and a, a question that we get often is from moms and they're like, yeah, yeah but you know, I'm a, I'm a mom and I've got kids and yeah. like, I can't do this, but obviously it's possible because some people can do it. So, so how do you, how do you, how are you a mom? How do you run a business? And you know, like these are yeah. big businesses as well yeah. and fit everything in. And manage it I think, all. I think you have to be, I think you have to be good at avoiding distraction at the best of times. When you have young kids and you're a mom, you have to be like a ninja good at avoiding anything <laughs> that waste time. And so I get up really early. I get up at about 4, 4.15 in the morning um, before my kids get up. So that's when I either exercise or get a bit of work done. So I think you oh. just need to be, super conscious of how you use your time because if you want to obviously raise amazing children and I still we take I take them to school and we pick them up and um and fit business in then you just have to avoid all the things that aren't priorities and I think that that takes a huge amount of discipline to do and I think that it, it's not simple and that's why I think people are like oh it's too hard I just can't fit everything in and and some days there are things right times where I'm like, oh shit, I can't fit everything in. Mm. But what are the big things that I, that I know are going to move me forward and, and focusing on those? So I think you just have to be really clear on what you're trying to do, how you're trying to get there and simplify everything. You know, we, I lead a really simple life. We don't have a ginormous house or anything because it's just like that just adds weight mm. to us. Um, but we focus on the really, the really important simple things um, and then really good time management. Mm. I, I think is the only way you know we all need good time management but yeah. when you manage little humans as well as <laughs> stuff you um you have to be pretty good at it and just that's why things like social media it's like i'm not interested in spending an hour on social i don't have an hour to spend on social media yeah. it's a waste of my time i yeah. could do something so much better than do that mm. and so i think that that's that's um it's just it's discipline i think to yeah. a degree yeah that's true it's so amazing what you're saying is like it, it's once again, it's the same thing of discipline and, and you know what you can do. It might not be easy, but waking up at four o'clock is bloody hard. And, <laughs> but, but, but are you, it's like a lot of people will complain and say it's not possible, but then they want to wake up at six thirty or seven. Like, and they don't have time. And it's like, well, exactly. 
Like yeah. make a decision. What do you want to do? Decision. What do you want to do? Do you want to have a business? And some people don't. Yes, and that's exactly. it. Yeah. Or if you really want to do a marathon. So we, I just signed up for a marathon. I don't know why I've never done a marathon in awesome. my life. <laughs> and I'm like, what the heck? am I doing? But if you are going to do that, then you're going to be up at four o'clock in the morning to try and fit training in. So it's like anything. If you, if you take something on, then take it on. And, and, um, I think the process of growth happens in those challenging times and that's how we grow and transform. But if we don't put ourselves under pressure, hmm. um, we're never going to grow. So I think yeah. it's just, it's, we choose, we try to make things easy and they're not always easy. I have a friend that's running a ultra or it did actually um, run an ultra marathon here and she has, I think, yeah, she's got three young kids and it was exactly the same thing. She was waking up. Um, I like it blew my mind. She was waking up at two 30 in the morning. Yeah, what? To go run. <laughs> I'm not yeah. even lying. Like, is that even a real thing? I was like, yeah. what are you telling me? Yeah. And that, that was just the only time that worked. So then yeah. cause her husband also runs ultra marathons. So, they would have to like do different Tag times yeah. that they would go and literally wake up in the middle of the night. And I'm like, yeah. okay, that just gave me, gave given me such a different reference on my being so soft half the time, you know? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I've always, I've never wanted to do it. And I've always thought my, my partner does ultra marathons, So he's crazy. Like he's oh, nuts. Wow. And he kept saying to me, why don't you just do one? And I'm like, Oh, I just, you know, I was doing the whole, I don't run and I can't do that. And then I was <laughs> like, you know what? You actually, you can, anybody can. Yeah. Um, and so now it's just more like, okay, I choose to take that challenge on. Um, yeah. And I think with, with, with me, I know when I take on a challenge, then I've taken it on. Yeah. It's not just, you know, when I say I'm going to do something, it will be really hard, but I just know that I'll find a way to make it happen. And I think that that's a good approach to having whatever we take on in our life, whether it was, you know, I want to, want to be, I want to be a great mom. That's challenging. Mm be a really good mom is hard. Um, but if you take it on, then it's like, what do you have to do to, to, to achieve that? And it's usually not comfortable. Mm -hmm. yeah. Totally. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So many amazing lessons in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's really, really great speaking with you. So, I mean, we've, we've only got like a couple more questions. I, I just, uh, just, I guess we just like to find out, you know, what are you, um, excited about what, what cool stuff have you got coming up um, in the future um, in terms of like, I guess, business or life. You mentioned the marathon. Is there any other cool things? Yeah, I think um, humankind project is always something that excites me. Anything that we're doing. Um, I love that. Cause I, I get to collaborate with other really like-minded um, humans, whether they're, you know, a lot of them are women and their girlfriends and we, and we try to think about how can we raise money and that's creative for me. Mm. Um, you know, what could we do or, you know, that's fun. So I love that. That's something that drives me massively. Um, the marathon is something that I'll tell you how that goes after I do that. <laughs> when is it? Um, it's in November. It's in Queenstown. It's in, it's in New Zealand. Cool. Oh, yeah, cool. So, yeah, it'll be super cool. That'll be a hilly um, one. That's for sure. So apparently it's flat. So I oh, did wow. check it out. Okay, apparently. cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that I'm not even trying to run the whole thing. I'm like, I'm just going to finish it. Okay. So I reckon that's good. Um, so that's, that's exciting. Going back to Malawi with this, the, this group of humankind project, um, donors, the th all of us together next year is super exciting as well. And I think for us, just, you know, our kids, our kids are young. So I've got, you know, soldiers turn six and then my daughter turns nine soon. And then I've got an incredible 19 year old. So spending time with them is super important. Yeah. Um, and so that excites me being able to, to spend, spend time with them. Yeah. You actually took one of your daughters with you, didn't you To Yeah. So Tundi's been twice. So she's, she came in 2015 and 2017. So she's part of the group that will go back next year and she's personally fundraised since 2017 even through her HSC. So she, huh. yeah, so that I'll take all my kids. Um, wow. I think it's a huge lesson for them to, to, to learn as young as possible. I'll probably wait till they're about 13 or 14 before they mm -hmm. go. Cause it's, you know, it's a true experience. Yeah. Um, but I think it's held, you know, my eldest in good stead to understand the opportunity. And we talk about it. If something's overwhelming, I, we just kind of talk about, you know, what is it really, you know, such a big deal and it's yeah. a good reference point for her. And I think I will do that with all our kids. Oh, I think it's sure. amazing. Yeah. And that's so a, did, did you say her name was Tandy? 
Tundi, yes. Yeah, so Tundi, awesome. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say it's yeah. a great African yeah. name, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, so, um, where can people like uh, get in touch with you or or follow you or, or whatever if they want to find out more about you or just get in touch? Yeah, so um, usually Instagram is probably my easiest place to see what I'm up to. Um, and then the Humankind Project is more I will do a blog or we can contact through there and we send out information around what we're doing. Um, they're probably the best two forms in terms of staying up to date with anything that's happening Cool. in my Beautiful. world. Awesome. So for everyone listening open up your phone right now and go and follow Jacinta because she's up to amazing stuff. <laughs> so Jacinta, we have one last question for you and it's uh, uh, one we really love and it's what does being ridiculously human mean to you? I think to me, it means to do what's right, even, even if it's hard. So I think that we try to take the easy route all the time. And I think for us to lead, you know, an incredible, amazing, fulfilling life, then, um, then to take on the challenge and, and do what's right. And, and I think being kind to ourselves and being kind to others is, is sometimes not easy in, in the real world, but it's something that I think that we should be focused on. Hmm. Yeah. Love it. Very cool. <laughs> cool. So, so yeah, you go, Craig. Go for everybody. So yeah, no, I guess uh, just a, a massive thank you uh, from me uh, firstly, I'd just like to say that it's great to meet somebody who says super just as much as, uh, as Craig and I do. <laughs> I was like, cool, super cool. Yes. Yeah. Super cool. Super yeah. awesome. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> so that's, that's super. <laughs> um, but, uh, but no, just into like, you're such an incredible lady, seriously. Like, um, first you have, you have great uh, energy and, and a great smile, which, uh, which just makes it such an engaging conversation with you. Um, you're obviously super, super smart. Um, and as, as you also in from, from my side, I think like very humble in, in terms of everything that, um, that you've done and that you've achieved. And it's, uh, it's so great to, to see these traits in, um, in people. Um, and, yeah, this whole conversation was like a, a great lesson and I, I almost feel like we need to package it up for, to go to people. This is, this is mm. kind of how you kind of should try and model your life, you know, in terms of being a good person and um, doing well, being successful at the same time, contributing back to, to the world and to, to other people and uh, taking responsibility and being disciplined in your life. And um, just, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Like it's really been a, a good awakening as well for me and a good reminder to actually go, Gareth, actually you need to do more um, and uh, get involved in, in things again. So thank you so much for, for the chat and it's just been oh. really, really awesome. Super awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> and just, just briefly from my side, look, I couldn't agree more with what Gareth just said and you are seriously the embodiment of a leader, you know, like or a modern day futuristic leader that is super caring and you just have this uh, in, sort of engaging way about you that that makes you want to um you know work with you and and listen to you and and that's really what a leader should be it's not someone telling you what to do but i can tell you right now that the two of us are so inspired by what you're doing and that that's really what a leader should do is give you that inspiration so without you probably even realizing it that that's just your natural state is, is pretty amazing. So it's, it's very aspirational. And, um, you know, just want to, the, the down to earthness about you as well is, is something that we can all try and cultivate within our own lives. Like you've done so much, like way more than the average show blog on the street, but it's not, you, you don't have any of this feeling like you're walking around going, look at me, I'm this businesswoman. I'm like powerful and I, like we really appreciate that in people because it's not necessarily um, the way to go about things. So, so thank you for that. And uh, the last thing is what Gareth said is like the privilege, like we, we're so privileged, we're so grateful and honestly, we can't be reminded about it enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, so thanks for that great reminder and keep up the great work. We're rooting for you and we can't wait to see what you're up to in the future. So thanks for your time today. Oh, thank you so much. You too. It's been awesome talking to you. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air, stop at the toll, digging for chocolate.